for the last week, I have been saying I do not think Ryan Nemhart is going to come to Gonzaga. And man, oh man, am I happy to be wrong about this one. Let's discuss Ryan Nemhart and Graham E.K. committing to Mark Few's team on a special emergency episode of Locked on Zags right here. You are Locked on Zags, your daily podcast on the Gonzaga Bulldogs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is going on, y'all? Welcome into a special emergency episode here of the Locked On Zags podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I am your host, Andy Patton, and we had an episode today already in the can. It is already p- published, for those of you who maybe haven't checked it out yet, all about Nolan Hickman. Uh, good point. The third segment of that show is all about how Nolan Hickman could transition to more of an off-ball role this upcoming season, assuming the Zags add another point guard. And they did. So still check out that episode. But today we're going to talk Ryan Nemhard. We're going to talk about the surprise edition, him committing to Gonzaga over Arizona. We're going to talk about Graham E.K., who less of a surprise. A lot of people had already kind of projected that he was going to come to Spokane. But we'll talk about him, what his edition means. And then we'll close out this special episode discussing what's next, because Gonzaga still got some room On their roster, they may not be done making additions even after a very, very splashy Friday here in mid-April. Let's start with Ryan Nemhard. Ryan Nemhard, of course, somewhat surprisingly, not somewhat surprisingly, let me rephrase, extremely surprisingly entered the NCAA transfer portal after a monster season with the Creighton Blue Jays. He played 34 minutes a game last year, his sophomore year at Creighton, led this team to an Elite Eight appearance, had a 30-point game against Baylor in the NCAA tournament, really Looked like he was the perfect player to lead that team, a a really balanced, talented roster around him with a dominant center in Ryan Kalkbrenner, uh, elite wing in Baylor Shireman, players like Trey Alexander and Arthur Kaluma kind of filling really, really admirable roles for that team as well. And yet Ryan Nimhar decided, you know what, I want to see what else is out there. And he, he popped his name in the transfer portal pretty much immediately. For those who were kind of paying attention when this happened, I know a lot, of course, many everyday listeners remember us talking about that. And of course, folks who've just been paying attention saw the name Nemhard enter the portal and thought, hey, maybe maybe this is going to be for Gonzaga. But immediately there was conversation about how this was a connection to Arizona. Of course, it was easy to see why Kirk Creesa had already entered the transfer portal out of Arizona. So everybody in college basketball knew that the Arizona Wildcats, Tommy Lloyd, were looking for a new point guard. Tommy was the reason, the catalyst, the person who brought Andrew Nemhard from Florida to Gonzaga. So people thought, bing, bang, boom, Ryan Nemhard entering the transfer portal, going to go play for Tommy Lloyd at Arizona. And that's not what happened. <laughs> it's not what happened, folks. Gonzaga got in there. They got a visit with Ryan Nemhard. They brought him in along with Graham E.K. They both visited at the same time, an extremely successful visit this past weekend in Spokane. Uh, and Nemhard went to Arizona afterwards. And it is often advantageous to be the second visit. And that's what made this particularly surprising. As soon as Nemhard left Spokane and flew to Tucson without having committed to join the Zags, there was the assumption that, okay, he's going to go to Arizona. The assumption was there previously, but it became even stronger of like, unless Gonzaga can nab him while he's in town, he's not going to commit to Gonzaga. And we were wrong. And I got to tell you, I'm, I'm so happy to be wrong. For those who want a bit of a refresher on who Ryan Nemhart is, we talked a little bit about his production at Creighton. He averaged 12 points per game, 4.8 assists, and four boards per game. He shot 48% from two and 36% from three. Uh, some very key differences between him and Nolan Hickman, who he's going to replace him as the starting point guard. Nolan Hickman is not going anywhere. I don't think he is going to move over to an off-ball role and then still play kind of the the backup point guard minutes when Ryan Nemhart is not in the game. I think we'll see Hickman kind of still have some of those duties on the roster, but Nemhart is a much he, he he attacks the rim. He's a 35% three-point shooter, which is basically the same as Nolan Hickman. He takes more attempts per game. He shot about four attempts per game last year. Uh, but he he's a he attacks closeouts. He goes to the basket. Hickman was just under one free throw attempt per game. Nemhard was about two and a half. So a bigger example of a player who's more likely to go to the rim, more likely to attempt to finish through contact, uh, more likely to to take more three-point attempts, just 
does more with the basketball in his hands than Nolan Hickman does. And we saw that kind of bear itself out uh, in his two years at Creighton. We kind of talked about some of those things as being potential issues for Nolan Hook, a Nolan Hickman led offense. And now for the Zags, they're looking at a, an offense with it, it's the post Drew Timmy era. They do not have a player of that caliber on this roster. Graham EK is a solid addition and a high usage big down on the block. I think Anton Watson can clearly emerge into a player that you distribute the ball to more uh, on the block as well. But for Nemhard, the Zags needed a, a point guard who's going to make more things happen. They want to get out and transition more. They want to run more. They want to be a bit more high octane than they've been in the past couple of years, in part because of Drew Timmy. Not a knock on Drew by any stretch of the imagination, just a different kind of Gonzaga team emerging out of that era. And Ryan Nempart is the perfect player to do that because he likes to run. He gets out in transition. I mean, we remember what his brother looked like and and how, you know, yeah, that offense had a lot of Chet Holmgren, and a lot of Drew Timmy, but Andrew Nemhard ran the show. He was the straw that stirred the drink and he got Gonzaga out in transition in ways that buried other teams. Andrew Nemhard buried Memphis in the second half of that NCAA tournament game. Yes, Drew Timmy scored a lot of points in the first part of that second half, but Andrew Nemhard's ability to get out in transition is what buried them. Ryan Nemhard, he can do that. 4.8 assists and 2.1 turnovers per game last year. That's the guy you want running the point. He's going to be outstanding at that. You add in a guy like Steele Venters, who's a catch-and-shoot three-point shooter, who I think is going to benefit from having a point guard like Ryan Nemhard on the roster. You, of course, have other catch-and-shoot options. Ben Gregg, who I think is probably uh, a high-level bench player this year. I know a lot of people want to see him start. I think EK and, and Watson are going to start. This is, of course, assuming Anton Watson returns. We'll talk about that more in the second segment. But this addition at point guard in Ryan Nemhard allows the Zags to be a more run-and-gun, high-tempo, high-octane offense. And that's what Gonzaga has been known for for so long, and that's what we're about to see a return to. The, the roster that is being built is built more around that right now. And I can't tell you how excited I am to see how it shakes out. Again, they're not done, and we'll, we'll kind of close out the show talking about that. I think there's some more additions to be made, but a guard rotation with Nolan Hickman, with Ryan Nembhard, with Dusty Stromer, with potentially Malachi Smith, that's a team that should get out and go and go and go, and I think when you add in a shooter like Venters, uh, a post player like EK, of course a guy like Watson, who we know has a, a, a ton of athleticism, Ben Gregg as well, I think you're looking at a team that, that's going to be really, really, really fun next season. But let's discuss Graham E.K. now because I want to talk about Gonzaga's other commitment. We don't want to just bury him in the news of the Ryan Nemhard situation. E.K. is a big, big addition on his own. And we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about him, excuse me, after a word from today's sponsor, Built Bar. If you're looking for a delicious snack, but you do not want all of the sugar and calories, then you need the best tasting protein bar ever built. Built Bars are healthy and they taste amazing. They taste so good that you will not think they're healthy for you. What makes them so good? Well, for starters, they are all covered in 100% real dark chocolate. That's right, real chocolate. And they come in unbelievable flavors like churro, peanut butter, brownie, and cookies and cream. I'm not sure how Built does it, but these bars taste like a candy bar while maintaining amazing macros. They only have 130 calories, 4 grams of sugar, and a whopping 17 grams of protein. And now you don't need to wait around to get a box. For years, we've been talking about ordering your Built Bars at Built.com, but now you can get them at your local Walmart or Sam's Club while you can still get your specialty flavors at Built.com. That's right. Head to the nearest Walmart today, walk to the pharmacy section, and grab yourself a box of Built Bars. You can pick up a four-bar box of cookies and cream, double chocolate, or coconut puff. And if you're close to a Sam's Club, run in and grab a 13-bar box with our hit flavors, brownie batter puff and churro puff. You can thank me later. Built Bar, a proud sponsor of the Locked On Podcast Network. All right, folks, thank you all again for making Locked On Zags your first listen of the day. For some of you, your second listen of Locked On Zags today after that Nolan Hickman episode released just a few hours ago before this one. Every day or next week on the show, guess what? We're going to keep breaking this down, folks. We're going to keep talking Graham EK, keep talking Ryan Nembhard. What does it mean for the roster? What's next? What does it mean for so-and-so player, so-and-so player, et cetera, all sorts. We'll bring on guests to talk more about Nembhard, more about EK. It is going to be all about this reshaped Gonzaga roster. So if you're an everyday listener, get ready, get pumped. we got a lot of fantastic content coming your way. But for right now, we are talking Graham E.K. and the addition that he is. Again, the Ryan Nembhard news surprised us. 
Graham E.K.'s commitment didn't exactly surprise. I don't think that it should have surprised. Everyday listeners probably know, as we talked about Graham E.K. and the crystal balls he continued to pick up from recruiters after he committed to Gonzaga, we ha- or after he visited Gonzaga, I should say. And we never really heard a lot of other rumors bubbling about E.K., so kind of a good indication that Gonzaga was the place that he wanted to go. Uh, and sure enough, he takes his surprise visit to Spokane, uh, which, again, we kind of confirmed. We heard a bunch of sources. Many of you reached out to me individually to let me know that you saw EK, you heard EK was on campus, et cetera, et cetera. I appreciate that. Uh, definitely helped us pin down that he was, in fact, there last weekend. Uh, a little bit about who he is. He's a six foot nine forward, originally from Aurora, Colorado. He committed to Wyoming out of high school. Only played 12 games as a freshman during that 2020-2021 season. Uh, Very productive 12 games, though. 11.2 points, 5.5 boards, 61% on two-pointers. And then he blossomed, broke out in a significant way as a sophomore in that 2021-22 season. 33 games, 33 starts, 32 minutes per game. So he was out there pretty much all the dang time for the Cowboys. He averaged 19.5 points. 9.6 9.6 rebounds, 1.3 assists, 51.5% on twos. Not elite, mind you, but in a high usage role and in a conference that is very defensive focused in the Mountain West. I don't think that we want to knock that too much. He shot 27.3% on three. So, again, an area of his game that is somewhat there, but needs to be refined, needs to kind of glow up a little bit. We'll see if that's something that the Zags can kind of get out of his game a little bit more. He also shot 72% from the free throw line. And that's all we have on EK from a performance perspective because he did not play in the 2022-23 season. He suffered a foot injury early in the year. There was some conversation of him potentially making a midseason return, coming back for conference play. Wyoming was very bad last year, and I think that maybe EK could have come back. I don't know all of the all the medical details for EK at this point, but if he could have come back and Wyoming just decided to shut him down to not risk further injury, that makes sense. Uh, obviously, Gonzaga met with him. They have a very, very firm knowledge of where he is from a medical health perspective right now. Uh, the fact that they they obviously extended him one of their scholarships and invited him to come join the team makes me think they are pretty confident in his ability to contribute uh, as soon as this season. Obviously, if we hear any more on him from a medical perspective, we will report that. But my assumption right now is that he is going to be a healthy, immediate contributor with the Zags. And I think he's going to start. I think he's going to start alongside Anton Watson. uh, And I think that's going to push Ben Gregg into a high usage role off the bench. Uh, they could change that a little bit. Maybe they start Watson and Greg and have EK come off the bench. That wouldn't shock me, especially if they don't think he's quite at a hundred percent. The only, I don't want to say issue, but the only thing I'm curious to see how this is going to shake out is that EK and Watson are fairly similar on paper offensively. Defensively, there's a big difference. And and unfortunately, EK doesn't really bring a lot of rim protection. At least he hasn't historically. In his career, uh, I, I, he was not asked to be a rim protector at Wyoming. So again, it's it's somewhat similar to the Efton Reed situation where because a player hasn't been a rim protector, it doesn't mean they're not capable of being a rim protector. Now, Efton never really materialized into that role in part because he, he struggled with fouls. Uh, but for Ike, he just hasn't had to do that. Now, he's 6'9", so I don't think that he's going to be like a big enforcer type around the rim. And I do think that that is an area that the Zags, while they have – Plenty of bigs with Watson. This is assuming Watson returns, of course, with Watson, with Greg, with EK, with Braden Huff potentially filling a role there with Caden Perry, who could be a rim protector, but it's unclear how healthy he is. He has reported that he is planning to to be back and and step foot on the floor next year. So hopefully that means that uh, his recovery has been going well. But the Zags have a lot of bigs and they don't have a lot of rim protection. Still an area of need for this team. I don't know if they're going to be able to replenish it or not. Uh, But for Watson and uh, Watson and EK, it'll be interesting to see how they deploy those two guys offensively, whether they run a high low offense with them, whether they kind of don't play them together all that much, which would create more playing time for Ben Gregg, potentially create more playing time for uh, South Korean Yo and and, and have him kind of play a a small ball four role as a six, eight guy. Same with Alex Tui if they wanted to use him there, of course, Braden Huff, Caden Perry in that mix as well. So that'll be interesting to see how this all shakes out. But uh, I mean, again, 19 and, 
20 and 10 basically in the mountain West is extraordinary. Like that is really, really high level production. He's used to being a guy who gets the ball fed to him a lot on the block. Uh, I think Gonzaga is going to do that. Uh, we talked about it being more high octane, more run and gun offense, but I think when they get in their half court sets, I mean, Gonzaga has been reliant for decades in the Mark few era. They've been reliant when they get into half court sets, of utilizing a post player, both Anton Watson, both Ben Gregg, uh, Anton Watson, Ben Gregg, and Gra- Graham E.K. could all fill that role. Every single one of them could do that very easily for this team. So I think we'll see those guys still get a lot of touches, a lot of opportunities. But I am curious how this fit is going to work just with those players being somewhat similar. Uh, and, of course, curious how this is going to shape up on the offensive end – or, excuse me, on the defensive end for the Zags. But Graham E.K., a tremendous addition. When you lose Efton Reed, Andrew Timmy, of course, in the same offseason, you want to replenish that with some – proven talent in the front court and they have that unquestionably in ek here well what's next for the zags that's the biggest question that we still have next is the zags are not done they don't have to be done they can add more players via the transfer portal they have at least one scholarship open so let's explore what that might look like coming up right after this all right segment three here on this very special Bonus episode of the Locked On Zags podcast reacting to Gonzaga's surprise edition of Ryan Nempard in the transfer portal and edition of Graham E.K. in the transfer portal. And right now, as we're recording this at 1030 in the morning on Friday, just a few hours after the news broke about these two guys committing to the Zags, the Zags still have room for more additions. By my count, there are six players, six count them who are out the door for the Zags. That is Drew Timmy, that is Rasir Bolton, that is Julian Strother, Hunter Salas, Dominic Harris, Efton Reed. Six guys who we are not expecting back. That is five players who have come in the door up to this point for the Zags. That is, of course, the three transfers, Nemhard, EK, Steele, Venters from Eastern Washington, and the two freshmen, Dusty Stromer and Alex Tui. A reminder that Yo took Martinez Arlauskas' scholarship when he joined the team at midseason last year, so he is not a new addition in terms of scholarships. So the Zags still have one left, and this is without us counting either Malachi Smith or Anton Watson. Uh, I continue to maintain that I believe Anton Watson will declare for the NBA draft, but that he will return to Gonzaga. Malachi Smith, a lot of people are, are kind of operating as if he's coming back. I'm still not sure. I really think there's a chance that Malachi Smith has has played his final game in a Gonzaga uniform. If I'm wrong and he's back, awesome. It would be fantastic to have Nemhard Hickman Smith be the catalysts of your guard rotation. But he may not be back. And if so, then the Zags would have two scholarships open. But even as it stands right now, they have one. They have one. And if we look at what this potential lineup rotation looks like, it's clear where they need to make those additions. Right now... I project a potential starting lineup for the Zags as Graham E.K., Anton Watson, Steele Venters, Nolan Hickman, and Ryan Nemhard. I feel pretty darn good about that. E.K. and Watson, two posts, both 6'9", so not a ton of size, but enough size. We've seen a lot of teams run small in the past as well. Venters is 6'7", a good outside shooter, floor spacer. Hickman and Nemhard, I think, is a very dynamic backcourt. Your reserves in this situation, Ben Gregg, I think, is your sixth man. I think he plays a ton of minutes. Uh, And then you have Dusty Stromer, and then you have Malachi Smith if he comes back. And then I think you figure in the other two freshmen, Yo and Tui, could be in that mix as well. But they're both forwards. They both play similar positions to Steel Venters, to Ben Gregg, to Anton Watson. Like they're not necessarily you don't need all of those guys there. And then, of course, you have Braden Huff, you have Caden Perry, and and those guys, I don't know that they're going to necessarily fight for significant minutes. But if you don't have Malachi Smith, or even if you do have Malachi Smith, it's clear you need more guards. This is clear. There's plenty of players in the front court now with Graham E.K. added. E.K., Watson, Greg, Tui, Huff, Perry, Yo, all of those guys can potentially play at the four or five. So you don't need anything more there, assuming you feel good about what Huff and Perry can potentially bring. Guard room, Hickman, Nemhard, Stromer, who's a true freshman. I think you can count on him to play a role, but it's still a little bit risky. And unless you get Malachi Smith back, that's all you have. So you need more additions in the backcourt. Gonzaga cannot be done. Does this mean they're going to go out and get Taron Armstrong? Probably not. I suspect that Taron Armstrong in part is waiting because he wants to make sure that he's going to land somewhere where he's going to play a significant role. And he watched Creighton gobble up uh, Stephen Ashworth. 
He watched Xavier uh, gobble up Davion McKnight, a high-level transfer that they added from, I believe, Western Kentucky. Uh, And he watched Gonzaga gobble up Ryan Nemhard. And now I wonder if Armstrong, whose top four was those three programs as well as Providence, either he ends up at Providence or he re kind of reevaluates. Does Tommy Lloyd pivot to Taron Armstrong? I mean, that's a real possibility at this point for Lloyd to figure out what, who am I going to add? I don't have Kirk Kreese anymore. My, my backup option or my, my top option was Ryan Nemhard. Now that's out the door. So what is he going to do next? What is he going to do next? And Armstrong makes sense there for him, but for the Zags, like I think there's still an addition to be made and maybe it's more of an Aaron cook type. An Aaron Cook, Gino Crandall, it's a backup point guard. It's a guy you bring in with the intention of being a backup point guard. Uh, a defensive-minded guard, I think, would be fantastic because they need to replace Hunter Salas. Uh, Nemhard and Hickman are both fine defensive players. Malachi Smith is a, is a good defensive player as well, but they need more there. And I think that finding that kind of a true point guard, it doesn't necessarily have to be a true point guard. Because I think, uh, obviously, Nembhard's going to play 30-plus minutes per game, and he's a peer point guard, and Hickman can fill the rest of those point guard minutes. So maybe you find a combo guard who's a good defensive player. Maybe you do find another peer point guard who's a defensive player, and you kind of just really leave Hickman in that off-ball role. I don't know that it matters all that much. I think you just find the best, the best guard you can find that is willing to come to your program knowing that they're not going to start. I think that's the objective now. That's the goal. And the Zags will find somebody because they always do. Because they always do. Because they found these these Crandall guys in the past. Even if you're looking at non-point guards, you want to look at Jordan Matthews. Yes, I know he came in and started. Same with Byron Wesley. Those guys were starters. Uh, but you can find guys like that in the portal. Admon Gilder. Maybe that's a better example because he did start to begin the season and then he got replaced by Joe Eliai. And guess what? He just settled into a backup shooting guard role and was really good at it. That's the kind of guy you find. That's the last piece right now. You go find that guy and you might have yourself a complete roster that... A couple weeks ago, a lot of Gonzaga fans were real nervous, wasn't going to look anywhere like this, and now it does. And you find that final piece, and you put these pieces together, and you start working, this is going to be a good basketball team next season. Are they in contention to be the number one seed and and run through it like they did in 2021? I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure about that. We'll have to see a little bit more about EK's health. We'll have to find out if Watson and Smith are coming back, et cetera. But the roadmap is there. Folks, the the roadmap is there. And a few days ago... Heck, even yesterday, it, it maybe wasn't there. Now, with Ryan Nemhard leading the show, with another high-level 20-point-per-game score on the uh, on the front court in Graham EK, the roadmap is there. They got a few more pieces to put together, but they also got a long time. Transfer portal window doesn't end until May 18th. That's the last date people can put their name in the portal. There's still a lot of good players to be added, and the Zags are going to get some more. Maybe one more, maybe two more, but they're not done. But right now, the map is complete, and you can look at it, and you can see the path to this team being back in the Elite Eight, back in the Final Four, back contending for a national championship. And man, oh man, does that make for what is about to be a much more fun offseason than it looked like before. Thanks for indulging the bonus episode here, Locked on Zags. Again, don't miss the Nolan Hickman episode. I don't like burying episodes as much as I can avoid it, and I think it's still very timely and very topical because we discussed him playing a more off-ball role, so definitely check that one out. Come back next week. We'll have more updates on Nemhard, more on EK, more on what the rest of Gonzaga's offseason is going to look like. But for now, Zags fans, have a fantastic weekend. Come say hi at the Gonzaga baseball game on Sunday afternoon in Portland if you are in the area. And, of course, especially now, after a fantastic day for the Gonzaga Bulldogs franchise, let's give a hearty, hearty, hearty Go Zags to end the week.